love leading music. Praise the Lord for that. I would like to start with a word of prayer. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for the privilege of the house of God. Lord God, the place of preaching, prayer, praise. A place, Lord Heavenly Father, where so many times you've spoken to my heart and troubled my waters, convicted and blessed and spoke to. And thank you, God, for our pastor. And he's the, he's the, he's the pastor. This is his pulpit. Lord, it's your, it's your people. And I pray, Lord God, that you would loose my tongue, that you would just, you would bring all the glory and speak to us through your word. Amen. I would like to try to start off. Uh, can I be heard? Pastor was talking to me about this night. Um, I actually got here last Sunday night and was a week ahead, thought I was preaching last Sunday night and I wasn't ready. <laughs> And I was in full panic. I was like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Lord, I'm going to preach something, but I don't know what it is. And then pastor said, pray for Brother John. He's preaching next Sunday. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so I, I, I got a hold of God this week. Amen. And, uh, but he asked me if I might consider a military um, or a Memorial Day theme. And I'd like to start off with that, if I may, before I actually break the bread of life. Um, but what I'd like you to do is come with me in your minds right now. And we're back in 1943. And we're in a place that's called um, East Anglia, England. It's the southern, southeastern bulge of England down there. And it's four in the morning. And it's not been real quiet all night, but there's been clanking and the sounds of maintenance being done during the night. And... There's been some sounds, but during the night, hundreds, yea, thousands of air crew have been trying to get sleep. It's been said by historians that when bomber pilots would first get to England to the 8th, they would show up confident, and some of them cocky and kind of brazen. And as they would get off the buses or trains and they would walk onto the base that they were stationed at, there's bases all over East Anglia. They would meet pilots who were walking around, gaunt-looking expressions on their faces and bags under their eyes, walking around like, and I hate to say the word, but zombies. You know, we walking around, and these guys would see that and have taken back many times. But about four in the morning, men would start to wake up or be woken up, and they'd get up and they'd grumble into their, their clothes, and they'd head to breakfast. And they'd get a plate of many times nothing more than powdered eggs and some kind of mystery meat. That's a military thing, mystery meat. But you, you couldn't always identify it, but man, you were glad to have it. And they would suck down as many cups of coffee as they possibly could. No French vanilla, most of the time not even any sugar. And these same men then would straggle out of chow hall. Now keep in mind, they're sleeping in, in tents or they're sleeping in Quonset huts, never very warm. And... Um, they'd head off to, deep, to morning brief. Hundreds of men would come in and they'd go sit down in these rooms and they'd be all huddled forward. They'd have all their notepads. All that stuff would be on their lap. They'd be sitting there waiting for the commander to come in and he would walk in and say, on this particular morning, August 17th, 1943, it's not a milk run, folks. Today we're going to Regensburg and we're going to Oh, wouldn't you know, I just forgot the name of the, the other one. But it's a, a ball bearing factory in Germany and a Messerschmitt ME 109 factory. We've got to knock them both out. We've got to knock out ME 109 production. We've got to knock out the ball bearings so they can stop producing other things. These planes would begin to take off in the morning. These air crews would get in there. Keep in mind, a lot of these guys. Now, some of you ladies in here could have been married to some of these guys. All right. These guys were 18 to 21 years old. Sometimes Gramps in the air crew would be a 23-year-old pilot. They would start up those B-17s. And those B-17s, we look at them, they're called flying fortresses. Oh, they must have been so strong, powerful. They had very little in the form of armor. They're completely skinned with aluminum skin, very thin. And they would go up and they'd begin to climb and the first one would take off and he would circle around the base. And for an hour or so, they'd circle around the base, gathering more and more planes, and then heading out over the channel. Well, this particular morning as they were circling, there was no weather between England and where they were going, Schweinfurt and Regensburg. 
And the Germans, with their early radar, were able to pick them up formating over East Anglia before they even began their trek. They were already taking off two hours late. They were the, they were the first wing, the, 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 fourth, the fourth bomber wing under the 8th Air Force. They began going out. The first wing got held up for weather, morning fog, where they were in East Anglia. Keep them from getting up until hour and oh, 90 minutes later. When these groups finally started going out, they got straggled out, even once they were formated. 15 miles long, they were heading across the channel. Germany's watching them. Germany is watching them as they're coming with these aircraft. They got their altitude. They got their airspeed. They figure out where they're going. These guys are heading into the activity that named the 8th Air Force the Bloody 8th. By the time it was all over with and they got to Regensburgs, the one that did, and the ones that got to Schweinfurt, by the time they got there, already 30-plus airplanes, B-17 bombers, had been shot down by Falk Wolf 190s and ME 109s. The temperature up there is between 50 and 70 degree, degrees Fahrenheit. These young men up in these aircraft are breathing through these things, and a big old air bottle out here would expand as they would inhale and exhale, and the little tube going from that would freeze up with their condensation. So on top of all their other duties, they got to keep squeezing that to break the ice. Sometimes guys would forget to do that, and they'd pass out of They would die. At that temperature up there, they're freezing cold. And they're finally making it to the target. 30 planes were already shot out before. That's 10 to 11 men per plane. Regensburg and, and, and Schweinfurt was finally bombed. The planes began to turn back. Keep in mind, at this time, yet they still didn't have air cover. They didn't have escort that could fly them all the way to Germany. They could fly them to the border, and then the fighter planes had to turn back. These guys up there are lumbering through the sky at five, five and a half miles up, freezing cold with no support, and they're being blown out of the sky, sitting ducks. On the return trip, an additional 30-plus got shot down. We lost 60-plus men on this mission. And you say, what's the difference between Memorial Day and... Um, Oh my goodness, where's the one? Veterans Day. The difference is you can shake the hand of and buy a breakfast for the veteran. That's the difference. These kids were from Oklahoma. They were from Kalispell, Montana. They were from Rhode Island. They were from California. Men just like Bill here, just like Gary. Men just like me, just young kids. And I've read... And I've watched and listened to hundreds of hours, literally, since I became a truck driver. Uh, YouTube is full of stories and accounts of what, what took place. You call, the greatest generation ever doesn't even really cover it. Just regular people. I wonder when I read about it, when I hear about these young boys and young women, too. I'm just talking about one event on the 17th of August, 1943. Women were involved. People that just loved their country, they loved their flag, they just wanted to stand up for freedom, for their home, for mom. The bombers many times were painted with pictures, almost all bombers, and not all the pictures were moral and you could look at it, but every picture painted on the side of the aircraft was painted on there to represent something to incite and to cause these young men as they would climb up in the nose of that B-17 they would touch whatever pitch it was. They would come back, they would kiss whatever pitch it was. Sometimes there were clown pictures, goofy pictures, funny pictures. There were sensual pictures. They were all pictures that meant a lot to these troops. These boys sometimes would go over there and get shot down and killed and obliterated on their first mission. The, the eighth, the bloody eighth, decided that they had to fly 25 missions. Their entire plane, their entire crew had to complete 25 missions before they could come back. And they didn't all make it. Just in that one mission alone, we lost over 600 men. And I want to talk about the sacrifice that these men made. As we, we in this room, I'm preaching to the choir in here. Most of us in here, you know, we've been going to church a long time. We know the Lord. We understand. We appreciate decency. and We appreciate the offer and the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. But 
we're free today because of what took place 80 years ago. And we're at a point in America's history again where I don't know where it's going next. There's no defined enemy. And, and, and hope seems gone. I'll be honest with you. In the previous two years, my whole philosophy and attitude about our nation in the condition she is has been absolutely changed. I wouldn't mind if Jesus came tonight. I used to say, I want to live to see 80. I just want, I love life. I just want, but I'm almost to the point where I'm just like, Lord, come take us now. Amen. And it reminds me of a preacher when we were stationed in England in the 80s. We were in East Anglia. We were at a base that was a B-17 base. I've seen the Quonset cuts. I've worked in them. I went and got tools. My hangar, Hangar 45 at RAF Bentwaters. You can Google it up. Look up RAF Bentwaters. Look up Hangar 45. You'll see the hangar I worked in for five and a half years. It was a B-17 hangar in World War II. And these airports were X's of runways and taxiways just literally carved out in the fields where families were willingly given up their property so that we could come in and help them. And the British people at first were saying, oh, these Yanks coming over here, they're not hard workers. They're just that and the other thing. And they would come over here. They're just going to be in the way. They're just going to be causing trouble. And in a short amount of time after they had seen the sacrifices and the efforts, they would call our troops, our boys. They would say, we just saw our boys leave this morning. And many of the farmers and their wives say the quietest time that they would ever experience during the World War II period of time was when the planes would leave. And it would be loud and noisy as hundreds of planes would be starting up and taxiing and idling around. And they had to do this because they were tailwheel planes and the, they had to, hundreds of them. And then they would take off and they would formate over the town. Sometimes they would impact each other and they would get killed before they even got to the coast and headed over. And then it would go dead quiet all the rest of the morning, all into the afternoon. And when the planes came back, they straggled back. One here, two there. My landlord, Derek, what was their last? Pierce. Derek Pierce. He said there's a Falk Wolf 190 crashed over there that he and his boy, his buddies went, his mates went and played on weeks after it crashed. It was a 109, and there was a, a crash site where a B-17 came back over with bloody people in it. They were bailing out. They came into the town of Yoxford, where we lived, and they were taken by the townspeople and treated before the ambulances and all that stuff came and took them off. But the B-17 circled around and finally crashed a quarter mile from where our house was. This was real to them. But what I'm saying is the sacrifice was made when, when men and women stood up Raise your right hand, please. And then you would repeat, as many of us have. And by doing so, you were signing a blank check. And at the bottom, you were signing your name. And the price was up to and including your life. Well, the sacrifice that was made for us to have, it's no joke. It doesn't need to be played with. That flag on the dashboard of your pickup truck, that flag outside of Burger King, that flag outside of the RV, which is usually one of the biggest flags in the community, that flag means something. It means sacrifice. It means service. It means dedication. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful symbol. But I'd like to take us now to the book of John chapter 10. And I hope, I, I hope this was a, a help. I wanted to pay tribute to Memorial Day and the sacrifices of our troops. But there's a, a battle that took place 2,000 years ago on a cross for something even greater than our liberties and our freedoms. The Lord God Almighty, His Son stepped forward one day and His Father said, it's time. And Jesus stepped off of eternity onto the planet Earth. He became a man. The Bible says uh, in the fullness of times, He became he became flesh, and he lived on this cesspool that we call earth. And he felt everything we'd ever felt. The Bible says he suffered. He was tempted in all points, like as we are. Every point, yet without sin. 
In the book of John, chapter 10, I'm reading at verse 1. I'm going to read down to verse 18. The Bible says, Jesus talking here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. I like that right there. Remember Lazarus? I always get a chuckle out of the fact that Lazarus was in the grave, and Jesus didn't say, come forth. He'd have had a crowd that day. <laughs> he said, Lazarus, I want to talk to you. Lazarus, you come front and center. But he calls his own sheep by name. Next time you're reading through Numbers, Leviticus, um, those books, and you're coming up on those genealogies, try a little bit to get some of those names down. Because our God delights in writing names down, praise the Lord. He loves to write names down. He, he calls them, he calls his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Kind of makes you look at maybe some of the radio preachers or TV preachers that we might be listening to sometimes. You don't always know if what they're saying is the truth, but praise God, we at this time, and since its inception, have had a man of God in the pulpit, a King James loving, Christ exalting, God preaching preacher. Verily, verily, in verse 7, Jesus goes on to say, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man shall go in and out, um, by me, let me get that right. By me, if any man shall enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling. He's only there for the position, for the title, for the money, for being recognized. And careth not for the sheep. Jesus says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's what I tried to try to correlate here tonight. Young men and women in the past laid down their lives so that we could have liberty. But Jesus Christ, he says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And in verse 17, he says, Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. And I like verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And I kind of like to just look at a few points here. You see repeatedly in there, Jesus refers to himself. And he proceeds it with the word, I am. I am the door. He's the porter. He's the... Um, but the, the list goes on. I've got, I got a small list of, I, um, of what Jesus is to look at right here. Um, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Some things that Jesus is, first of all, he's the bread of life. Now, when I started this message earlier this week, I had grandiose ideas of being theological and being all this kind of, and I started looking for names and I said, my soul, I got lost fast. I'm just, I'm just a Joe citizen. That's all I am. I'm a, just a Joseph. But in John chapter 6, you see that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He's the water of life. He's the light of the world. Look with me at John chapter 1. 
in John chapter 1. He's the light of the world. You know what? I don't know about you. My wife and I were driving home today, and I made the comment, doesn't that sun feel so good shining on, on our heads? From uh, And it did. It just feels so good when that sun peeks through. But in, in heaven, there's no need of that sun, and yet we're going to be blessed and warmed in his presence to be with Jesus. I know there's a lot of reasons and a lot of people we want to go to heaven to see. You know, and some people say, oh, I'm going to tell somebody so and so. I'm going to tell them such and such when I get to. I don't know about that, but I do know when we sit up inside heaven, we're going to see the very things Fanny Crosby saw when, when she walked in. Can you imagine living your whole life blind in a time when there wasn't a lot of agencies that would help people with disabilities. And the only people that would help her was those. Help may help you and just close friends, business associates, right around here, right around there. You go, here's your desk. Can you feel that? There you go. And uh, one day she passed off and she opened her eyes the very next instant with Jesus Christ. I shall know him to be with Jesus, he's the light of the world. In John chapter 1, I want to read a couple of verses of scripture here. In verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now notice, when I was looking at this, I was looking for this verse specifically, and I thought it was naming him, but notice that's a small L on the word light there. And it kind of threw me off until I got down here to verse 8. John the Baptist is talking. He's being talked about by Jesus. And John's uh, he, he, he confessed not and said, I am not that light. In verse 8, he says, he, Jesus says of John the Baptist, he was not that light. Now it's capital. Jesus is telling what John is saying, but he's telling what he's talking about is himself. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That's Jesus. He's the light of the world. He lighteneth every man that comes into the world. He died for every man, woman, and child that's ever been conceived. He died that every one of us could be saved. And, and um, he's the light of the world. Um, there's a, another verse I want to look at. Okay, no, that's it for the light. Some things that Jesus is, he's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. Next, I want to look at the fact that Jesus Christ is the word. Look with me at John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 19. In, in Revelation chapter 19, and um, it's a summation. It's the final proclamation of what the Bible sets forth all the way through it, that God is the word. And in chapter 19, verse 11, it talks about this title that Jesus Christ is. In verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was clothed, was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. He's the Word of God, folks. And it's in my, in my estimate, I've never known anything but the King James Bible. When my wife and I got married, we were going to a church similar in so many ways to this church here. And I learned in the country that the Word of God was first preached in English about the Bible being correct and pure and preserved in the King James Bible. But he's called the Word of God. He's the Word. It's not to be made fun of or trifled with. Sometimes I remember there was a, there was a comedian many, many years ago who used to say, the devil made me do it. Anybody remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. I'll tell you what, the devil tempts and tries and hangs up in front of us, but we never give in to anything but what we want to. Amen? And the more of the Word of God we have in us, the more ammunition we're going to have to say no. And sometimes if you got enough word in you at a, at a time when a temptation comes, you'll find, I'm just not hungry for that today. 
I'm just not, I'm not one bit thirsty for that today. Other times you haven't been, listen, I'm a, I believe because I've seen it in my life over and over and over again. I'm no more full of the Spirit of God than I am of the Word of God. And my tank runs dry fast. I have to fill up on the Scriptures or I'm not, or I'm a, I'm, I can't possibly do it right, do anything right. But you are what you eat. Amen? And the Word of God, when you consume it, He's called the bread of life. And if you will, we need to go to the heavenly subway and get some of that, amen, some of that, that bread of life. He's called the word of God. He's called the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection. And uh, the book of John chapter 11, John chapter 11, he is the resurrection. Now, if you look up the word resurrection, that alone is incredible. To come back to life. <laughs> okay, to come back to life. And there's been many, but comparatively few, when you compare to humanity through the centuries, there's been many people who've been brought back to life. Okay? But Jesus Christ did it. <laughs> you know, the Lord God Almighty is the one that He laid across the young boy and breathed into His mouth and His nostrils, and the young boy revived. He took... He took the young lady's hand. What was her name? Tabitha? I think it was a little Tabitha. And he said, Tabitha, I say unto thee, arise. She was gone. Uh, Lazarus, he was gone. Way gone. Okay, that boy, they said it right when they say, it's been three. This he, No, don't touch that. That's going to be a mess in there. And Jesus simply said, Lazarus, Lazarus come on out. Ladies and gentlemen, Lazarus. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there then. I like Ephesians chapter 2 when it talks about he, in the ages to come, he shall show, basically, if you look at what it says there, he's going to show us what took place down through the eons of time and back into eternity to bring us salvation. He's going to walk down the hallway with us. Remember that time right there? This is, this is what happened there. Family, this is what happened right there. And, 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 and this, um, the picture right over here depicts this period of time. And uh, yeah, oh, you never knew about this over here, did you? And all the way through eternity, we're going to be, we're, I believe, we're going to be introduced over and over and over again to things to just praise and worship Him for. Because really the truth of the matter is you and I deserve to be in hell with our backs broken. We are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses do fade. They Mine fade fast. I don't know about you. My righteousness fade fast. I'll tell you how fast. Yesterday morning, Valerie and I went out for breakfast. And I was in such a good mood. I couldn't wait to take her out. We got to the parking lot. We got out of the vehicle. We walked inside to the restaurant. I'm not going to tell you which one because it doesn't matter. What happened, happened, and, it, you know, they'll, they'll, it won't happen again. But my plate came, and right in the middle of my eggs and sausage, and there was pinchers from the back of a pincher bug. Pretty good size ones, too. And I don't normally do this, but immediately I was de-appetized. I was repulsed to the point. I called the little lady back over and I said, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be a jerk, this, that, and the other thing. But uh, there's that thing in there and, and uh, we're just going to go. We're just going to leave. We're not going to. But I want to give you a tip. So I went to give her a tip and I'm still doing okay at this time. I'm disappointed, but I'm really. So I, I write out the check to give her a tip and they hand me a bill. And they said, we took your breakfast off of it, but we left your wife's on it. Well, Valerie had already told me mine. They cooked mine on the same griddle, so we weren't going to pay it. Okay, but so I tipped the young lady, and I put my hand up on her shoulder. I said, thank you so much. You've been so gracious. You're not the problem. This has nothing to do. I want to make sure you got your tip, this, that, and the other thing. In the meantime, I got blindsided by the managers and some other Wait staff came up and she's got the pictures on her finger and she goes, oh, look here. We don't really think it's an animal. We think it might be plant based. And I lost all sanctimonious, 
all I wanted was out of there, buddy. I didn't, because I knew I'm about this far away from saying mean things. <laughs> and so I said, you know what? Okay, we're, we're, we're not going to cause trouble. I'm not going online with this. We may even come back, but I got out of there. That's how quickly <laughs> my righteousness fades. <laughs> it took one pincher bug in my eggs to make me want to say mean things. But I want you to look at uh, the resurrection in John chapter 11, verse 43. Verse 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I've already mentioned it several times. I still get, I still get gospel bumps every time I read that. Because Lazarus came up out of the grave and he was whole. He didn't need a shower. They took the grave clothes off of him. They unwound him and there he was, ready for business. But look at verse 44. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Brother Blake, do you remember the, the day the Lord said to you, Loose him and let him go? How about you, Valerie? The day that I remember when the Lord loosed you and let you go. And I remember a few weeks later, we were at my pastor's house in England, and my wife was like, I just hope I did the right thing. And, and the pastor questioned her and, and talked about her profession and all that kind of stuff. And he said, Valerie, you know, from all outward appearances, you got saved. Do you remember the day when the Lord said to you, you're loosed, go free. And God's, or, God's loosed us. He set us free. That's what he did. He set us free. He's the true vine. He's the true vine. If you were to look at John 15, and I, Valerie asked me before we preach if it's going to be short, and I said, yeah, it's going to be preach. It's going to be short. It, it's going to be short. <laughs> Just about short. <laughs> In John chapter 15, concerning him being the true vine, he says it himself of himself, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. I didn't know what that meant for many years. The husbandman? What is that? Somebody who plays a part of a husband? or just, A husband is somebody who takes care of a garden, specifically a vine, a vineyard. And he goes out there and they, they have to cut, they, they harvest the grapes for sure, but they also go out there different times of the season. Sometimes they burn branches that they cut off and they stack them up and they, they work, they're trimming, they're pruning. And he doesn't trim, he's not necessarily out there trimming out of discipline, but he's trimming out of lessons in our lives, trimming things away. Trimming can be painful sometimes. I know it has been with me. I've been trimmed. Uh, I've been pruned a couple of times. It's like, whoa, Lord, I'm, I, I'm sorry. Help me, God. I, I wish I would have surrendered sooner. <laughs> I said, now that that's happened in my life, and I wish that hadn't happened, but Lord, thank you for dealing with me as a son. Thank you, Lord, for that truth. And he's the true vine. He's the true vine. And you know, I love the way that he says, I am the true vine. Because there's so many vines out here. There's so many people claiming. And I love what Pastor read this morning about when, when President Ronald Reagan, he said, we're not mandating a religion. We're not mandating worship. We're, this is not what our nation is about. In fact, our nation is strengthened when all sorts of different religions and religious people and people of faith have the freedom to express themselves and to do what they do. And I'm talking all religions. You know what, Christians, we wouldn't be afraid of Mohammedism and Confucianism. We wouldn't be afraid of, oh, what's the group, the, the Taliban and all that. These, What's that religion? It's Islam. We wouldn't be afraid of Islam. If we were full of God's word, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go ahead and say that great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. I like what somebody said many, many years ago. You tell me what you're afraid of and I'll tell you how I can control you. And that's the truth. And that's the reason, pastor, there's some prayers I pray under my breath without even moving my lips. You call me, go ahead. You call me strange. If you want to, I believe the devil reads lips or his, his imps do. And there's things that I'm praying about that I'm struggling with. I don't want him to know. Because I know he'll take it around and say, oh, I heard about it. He'll put out something in front of you. Do, 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 do. What do you think of that? <laughs> and if I'm weak and not full of God's word, I'm going to give into that. Amen. I'm going to give into that. But I'm going to tell you right now. In, um, 
hide yourself in the scriptures. Hide yourself in the scriptures. Some things that he is. He, he says, I am. That means he is. It's present. He's eternal. He's everywhere. And he's every when. He's every when. Amen. He's at the doctor. When the doctor puts his stethoscope around and says, well, Bill, Sam, Pete, you got a bill of health. Clean. You're good to the next one. But he's in that same room when the doctor says, we're going to have to run some tests. We're going to shove you in the CT. He's still God and in control when we lose our spouse. Yesterday, a precious man lost his wife. Friday, lost his wife. She'd been struggling with cancer bravely, so sweetly and so strongly for a long time. And she died. And he's alone without his wife. Yesterday he woke up, not a married man anymore. I'm going to tell you right now, death is real. He's with us. He is, I am everywhere. He's fairer than the lilies. You want to sing that with me? He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out of the tomb. He's all that my hungering spirit craves. Oh, I'd rather have Jesus than anything, bring it, than to be the king of a vast domain, or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this old world affords today. Jesus is the great I am. He's everything we need. Pastor, I'm about done. If you 